Genesis chapter 9, Noah and his sons coming out of their ark in a single episode that takes place sometime after that somehow is a, a touchstone of very large things that have to do with the conclusion of the age and the fulfillment of the mystery of Israel and the the nations that were spoken prophetically by Noah when he came out of his sleep, out of his stupor, out of his drunkenness. And uh, it's remarkable how terse the whole description is, T-E-R-S-E, how stingy God is in his description of this little episode, seeing that it is a microcosm of a macrocosm of unbelievable dimensions, and that it seems clear that Noah himself was not aware of the import of the event or even of the thing that issued out of his own mouth as he brings either blessing or cursing upon the, each of the three sons who are the progenitors of all mankind in all of the races that will fill the earth. So let's look at this text. Um, beginning in verse 18 of chapter 9. The sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, of, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, that's what the name Japheth actually means, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So, here's the preacher of righteousness falling into an embarrassing and humiliating departure from righteousness and drunkenness. It's hard to explain how uh, such an occasion could take place. And uh, it's unbecoming to the man and seems to be incompatible with his character. For he was the one righteous man of his generation. And yet somehow that episode provides an occasion which the sons can respond in the one way or the other and reveal the truth and depths of their own hearts, and evoke either blessing or curse on the basis of their response. So this is deserving of the uttermost attention, because it's something at the beginning. This is the new creation after the flood, and this is the first episode of such magnitude, and yet it touches the character of the nations, the whole issue of Shem, and his blessedness out of whose Stem comes Abraham and the and uh, Israel, the um, redemptive line of God, and the relationship between Jen, Shem and Japheth is more than hinted at. The fact that they the two participate in covering their father is almost like a statement of the one new man already being foreshadowed. There's a lot of this symbolic foreshadowing. Maybe you can help me with a better word than foreshadow, the pre something. A, pre, a prefiguring of things uh, that will later have much fuller expression have its inception here. So it's remarkable as much as the portent of the future lies in this one episode, it is described so discreetly and briefly. But it invites us to, to enter in. And for example, it's not Shem himself who receives the blessing, but the God of Shem. And uh, so it raises remarkable questions. 
and um, deserves every uh, examination. Well, maybe we ought to begin with the sin of Noah first, because that is the um, occasion that gives to the sons an opportunity to show the truth of their hearts. And maybe there's something for that in us, that when something untoward takes place, particularly in the man who's in a place of leadership or prominence, our response to that is uh, deeply revealing and indicative. <coughs> and maybe there's something in the human heart that, lights, that delights in the opportunity of swelling with conceit at the expense of someone who is otherwise honored and has fallen and takes a lower place. And you can delight in his predicament. But what does that say of the condition of your heart? Well, though the scripture does not tell us, you can almost imply when it says, and he went out and told his brothers who were outside. He did more than just relate a description of the event. You have to imagine with Holy Ghost imagining that he told them with a certain relish, mm -hmm. a certain kind of delight. He was rubbing his hands in glee to have found an occasion to see his father was dishonored. But instead of en encouraging and engaging the other two sons to join him in that celebration of the father's fall, they ignored or refused to be taken in with that spirit and reacted in an altogether other way. And they took the cloak, put it upon their shoulders, and walked backward through the tent and covered their father and averted their gaze to look upon his nakedness. In little preliminary conversations that we have been having in these days, what would the history of the church with, the, with Israel have been if we had averted our gaze and covered their nakedness in the shame that has been their condition for these uh, two millennia and longer. But instead we have reacted, the church, more like Ham or Canaan than we have Japheth or Shem. The church has taken a certain kind of perverse delight in the fallenness of Israel you can even see that in the architecture of uh, medieval churches where Israel is depicted as a fallen woman mm -hmm. with a blindfold and a broken reed. And the church on the other portal is the mighty and victorious uh, overcoming figure. So one is the, disres the fallen, the one into, into disrespect, and the other the exalted church who exalts at the expense of the fallen one. Mm -hmm. Completely contrary to the spirit of what Shem exhibited and that Noah so honored when he came out of his drunkenness and recognized the quality and the character of this act. And the quality and character of that act of Shem is the issue of Shem himself. What he exhibited intuitively and instinctively in covering his father gets at the very genius, the quintessence, the heart of what God calls Shem to be. Or else, what is the virtue of Japheth dwelling in his tent? Is, what, what need? If Japheth is enlarged, and he's the European in technology and culture, civilization, what need does he have to bow to enter the tent of a man who is only spiritual? Mm -hmm. But unless he dwells in that tent, there's an incompletedness about Japheth. And those things that constitute his virtue in enlargement become also the prospect for evil. World War II, World War I, the great massacres on the battlefields where entire generations were wiped out, where you can visit today in France the ossuary, where the bones have been kept, they are larger than a battlefield. And how many potential Beethovens and Brahms and great writers and philosophers and theologians and uh, men, that, men that would have aided Mankind and their descendants were wiped out in a little uh, thing called no man's land where German and French youth battled each other for a piece of scarred territory that was no consequence. That's also an aspect of Japheth. Japheth is enlargement not only for good, but also equally potentially for evil. 
So to allow Japheth to continue as Japheth is to bring not only the promise of the, of um, increase in commerce and trade and the things that prosper mankind through his ingenuity and enlargement, but also the, equally a capacity for destruction and devastation. Forty million lives of World War II, and I think a comparable number, World War I, not to speak of the scars, the psychological, social consequences of war and what uh, what it leaves that becomes the fertile ground for yet future conflict, which is the character of our present generation. All of that is Japheth, without the benefit that would have come to him, that must come to him from one source only, exclusively, and that is Shem. What is this Shem that is God's provision for Japheth and the provision for us all? What is the distinctive of the line that issues from him, out of which God's redemption is to come through Abraham and his sons and the, and the sons of Jacob and the sons of Israel and the, the Jesus, the Messiah, that comes out of the Semitic line. All of that has in its um, first expression, how, can, how shall we say it? So the, uh, uh, something nuclear in this one act that is altogether uh, spontaneous, that is unrehearsed, Shem exhibits something of the character that God has so blessed and will it in time bless Shem, uh, bless Japheth and bless the nations of the world. So we need to investigate <laughs> what is exhibited in that act that is of the essence of the uh, people that God has appointed to bless all the uh, nations of the earth, all the families of the earth, because I believe that it is expressed in this one significant and symbolic act. What a man does when he's taken by surprise, when he has had no preparation or forethought, is what he in fact is. What we exhibit in the moment that strikes us from the blind side is telling in every way of what we in fact are in God. And that's what was revealed in that moment. Ham, Canaan, the father, son, somehow are labeled together in the indictment and curse that comes from Noah, Noah's lips. And um, Shem is given an extravagant blessing. Blessed is the God of Shem. Well, why would he say that? Why, why didn't Noah, who is speaking now prophetically as the preacher of righteousness, say, blessed be Shem? If cursed be Canaan, and you'll be a servant throughout all generations and a servant of servants or a servant to servants why didn't he equally bless Shem why does he bless the God of Shem rather than Shem himself these are the kinds of things that we need to draw out exegete because I think of course it has to be utterly significant anyone have a thought to what degree was Shem's act itself a revelation of his God to what degree was Shem's act divinely inspired or grew out of the kind of communion that Shem already had with God that is not ever anywhere spoken in scripture but is revealed in the given moment. That is to say, what Shem did is what God himself would do. How did he know to cover his father? Why is that important? Why didn't he just let the man sleep it off and wake up naked and realize the humiliation of it. By the way, nakedness doesn't bother us, does it? I've got, I've got a sack full of articles from the New York Times that after the school is finished, I'm going to proliferate for as many as remain. And we're going to comment from these articles. And one day uh, before coming here, I, I clipped from the New York Times on art, culture, economy, world politics, the uh, editorial columns, the, the, the uh, response to the editor. It's a remarkable window on the world. And in that particular issue was an article on nudity on the stage in Broadway that the, that the uh, theater uh, criti uh, what do they call them? Critics. Editors or critics. critics are noticing now the, pre the prevalence of nudity on, on the platform, on the stage, on Broadway productions. It hardly matters what it is, whether it's a musical or drama. Nudity is becoming pronounced. 
and they showed pictures that, that looked like they're right out of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we are a nation that exalts in nudity, whereas evidently from the beginning, to be revealed as naked was considered a statement of uttermost shame. And for children to see their own father naked somehow was something of an uttermost kind. So the question is, why didn't Shem just wait for his father to recover? Why go in backwards with that thing to drape him so that when he wakes he finds himself covered? When he could have recovered and realized and just pulled up his thing about him and come out. No, not a moment was to be lost that somehow for this father, the preacher of righteousness, you can almost say as the savior of mankind, the one who begins again the human race on the new earth, cannot for a moment be left in that condition uncovered. We, it means if we are not sensitive to um, what is involved in this, that we have been more touched by the world than we know. My son had to give me an enema two or three days ago before I went to the hospital, thinking that it would re relieve whatever was my problem, but I needed much more than that. But you know what it means to submit to your son for an enema? <laughs> but he's a nurse as well as a son, so I'm grateful. And of course, we, we went through it like without any hitch, because we're not living in the biblical mentality. We're not living in a mindset that has completely dissipated in time. We're living in modernity. We're living in an age where nakedness and the revelation of flesh is so commonplace that we hardly turn aside to see. So we need to go back, because um, we are part of Shem as the church. And we need to recover whatever is the issue of honoring and covering that in the first creation and the second creation we have the two similar acts of the covering of nakedness, one by God directly through skins and the second through a son, the son of Noah, but more properly the son of God, acting in God and acting for God and doing the very same thing because he had a heart that was which, how should we say it was in tune with the mind and heart of God himself and that it was Shem's initiative Japheth went along praise God for that and in fact in going along with Shem isn't that very suggestive of what it means to dwell in the tent of Shem it's more than just coming in from the rain it's coming into an attitude, a mentality, a disposition of an of a authentically spiritual kind. So I suspect that it was Shem who had the concept, had the thought. Because I think there's, that there's a significant point in the text that they averted their gaze. They purposely walked backwards and averted their gaze. They would not allow themselves for a moment to dwell on the exposed condition of the Father, lest it would excite in them the kind of superiority and disdain and contempt that already had its expression in Canaan and Ham. So, are we that careful ourselves today? Are we covering? Or are we delighting in the exposure, particularly of men of prominence who have been found out or have come to a moment of failing? And by the way, how do you explain the moment of failing? Why did Noah get drunk? Uh, is that his, his, the, the possibility of his humanity? Or was God himself setting a stage for which he allowed his servant to experience a humiliation that was needful in order to bring out and bring into view and to, to submit either to blessing or to cursing that which would characterize all of the nations of the men and all of the history uh, that was to follow. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That Noah himself was a servant of the Most High God. Mm -hmm. And what if that servanthood should require an, a moment of humiliation in which your whole character seems to be contradicted 
in that moment by an act that could never have been imagined issuing from you that people would never have expected seeing that you're the man of God and the man of prominence and God does not tell you in advance look here's what I'm going to do you, you need to, to come into a drunken condition in order to expose the hearts of your sons for in that exposure something will take place in blessing and curse that will affect all the disposition of nations and the mystery of Shem to the nations to the ends of the age. So, so bear, be prepared to bear this. But to be a servant, uh, as we said in yesterday's early morning prayer time, the word servant and son are interchangeable. They're synonyms. You cannot be a servant without being a son and a son without being a servant. Noah was a servant. And I'm just suspecting that a servant does not require explanation. A son does not require explanation. And if the purposes of God are served, that will set in motion an unfolding of something that ends in his eternal destiny and glory, you, you accept it. So that in Noah's drunkenness is a man suffering the humiliation for which he had no pre, what's the pre awareness No, it, it, it came upon him how did it come upon him? he grew a vine he planted a vine, he was a husbandman built a great ship and then he, then he was a farmer and he planted evidently a plant that had never had an existence in the earlier creation and no one knew of it and he took its fruit and made of it wine and in the drinking of it, he became drunk. So what would you say of his sin? Is, is it, it's almost like, if you let's, uh, ex, uh, accept the expression, a sin of innocence. It's not a sin of, of um, forethought, premonition, uh, calculation. It's something that came inadvertently. Who would know that to drink wine means to get drunk? Well, this was the first instance, and of course it left him in that helpless condition and stupor in which the whole episode has its, its origin. So we need to say something about Noah, who needs to be on it. He's actually the father of humanity, the father of mankind. There's a haunting verse in Malachi, I think it's one chapter 1, verse 6. It's an uh, indictment of Israel. If I am your father, where is my honor? We need to contemplate the word honor because it's totally fallen out of use. This, this is an age without honor. And uh, if you read the New York Times, uh, 10 or 12 of the leading Wall Street firms were indicted for malpractices of an actual criminal kind. But instead of taking these CEOs to jail, which they fully deserved, they only gave them a minor flick on the, on the wrist. They paid a $1.4 billion fine. And one of the Jewish CEOs of the leading Wall Street community uh, even publicly made a statement that, uh, what, what's causing all the furor? What's all the big deal? It's only a minor uh, indiscretion and we're paying for it financially, so that the head of the, of the stock market had to publicly rebuke him for failing to understand the magnitude of that with which they were caught in the act. Mm -hmm. Corporate crime today is one of the scandals of our generation mm -hmm. at the highest levels of corporate life. And those agencies that monitor corporations, what do they call them? That do the bookkeeping, Anderson, the CPAs, they themselves are Im uh, implicit in the crimes and know how to arrange the books in such a way and how to give these men very generous allowances and even corporations that are going bankrupt. And they know they're going bankrupt by their own malpractice and their own egotism, their own greed. Before they get out, they, uh, in their board meetings, they grant to each other a lifetime, a, a going away Pension. bonus, Pension. Pensions. a pension that runs to the many millions of dollars, while while the stockholders are left uh, with with a whole collapsed value 
these men are coming out smelling like rose, and it's a collusion between the agency that mar- that does their books and the men who profit from it. It has never before happened in American finance to this extent. Why? Because the whole moral climate of the nation has fallen. And men who formerly would never have condescended to, to allow themselves to be part of such practice, even if it meant millions for their personal aggrandizement, are now doing so because they have no sense of honor and therefore no sense of shame. So if Shem is to be what God intends it to be for Japheth, to be a redemptive presence in all the earth, honor needs to be restored. The sense of honor, the sense of covering, the the sense of shame. And uh, the question is, how did Shem know these things? How did Joseph know that to lie with Potiphar's wife would be to violate one of the commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. How did he know that before the commandments were given? How did Shem know that before the advent of law? Is a remarkable question because it means that one can have a proximity to God's heart and the sense of that the moral heart of God that does not require law. As I think Paul says somewhere, law is for the lawbreaker. And if that's true, then one of the issues between us and the Orthodox Jewish community now is the issue of law keeping. And my rabbi, with whom I see weekly, never fails to put his finger in my chest and say, well, since I've seen you less, have you been keeping the law? <laughs> like for whatever your profession of having been found of God, and you know God by the Spirit, and you even speak a heavenly language, and he's used you here and there, Are you keeping the law? That's the question. But if the law can be kept without the law, in the way that it was understood and kept by Joseph and exhibited by Shem, we have something in which to boast, not in a boastful way, but to say we don't need the requirement of an overt legalism. What we need is the same union with the God of Shem that Shem himself enjoyed, of which the scripture says nothing, but it is implied. For how else could Shem have known to do what he had done except by a proximity to the heart of God that was evidently in the very character of the man? And the statement that what a man does is what he in fact is. All the more when it's what he does comes without preparation, comes surprisingly, takes him from the blind side. What he does in that moment is what he in fact is. And we're going to have such a moment, or many such moments, in the last days, when something will come upon us in an untoward way, and an unexpected way, and our response or our reaction in that moment will be absolutely telling. It will either make or break a situation, will either convey the reality of God as Shem conveyed it, or it will reveal uh, that we don't, that we ourselves are not in the relationship in which we boast. So um, we need to give the attention to the fact that what Shem does, he does in the moment that takes him by surprise, mm-hmm. in which he could easily have been drawn in to the same response as Ham Canaan. That is to say, enjoy seeing the father humiliated, and that raises the question. Why would a son enjoy that? Why would an inferior or weaker member delight in seeing the stronger, the more powerful, the more prominent brought down and brought to a place lower than what they have known? The man who is the preacher of righteousness? Where is your righteousness now, Hatshat? Seems to be the spirit that took hold of Canaan and Ham. So we need to examine the anatomy of, of this phenomenon of delighting in the fall of a saint. Because I can remember from my earlier days in Yugoslavia how a woman had a dream that 20 years before the vice president of this Pentecostal organization had had an adulterous affair. And on the basis of that dream, totally unsupported as an allegation, the man was drummed out of office and 
removed scandalously, and I watched these Serbian saints delighting in his discomfort. So, and I've seen it in my own life and with my own sons, that there's something uh, that gives a son an up. Uh, how shall I say? There's something in the heart of the weaker and the younger that has opportunity to be gratified at the expense of the fall of the one who enjoys the place of prominence in God. And we need to examine that because that potentiality is with all of us. So what do you think it is? But what does it mean to be a son of Shem? What is the distinctive that, that Noah so honored in addressing Shem by, by blessing the God of Shem? Because Shem is the fruit of that God. A comment from the uh, commentary on Genesis. But it is the conduct of Ham and Canaan on this sad occasion that is emphatically stigmatized. It would seem that Canaan had some share in the offense committed, as he certainly had a principal share in the doom pronounced. By the way, Noah says, when he wakes from his drunkenness, he saw what his son had done to him. It gives a kind of an impression that he was taken advantage of in his drunkenness and in his nakedness in more than being left uncovered. Okay, so let me continue reading this. What precisely the offense was can scarcely be gathered from the narrative. That's why I'm complaining to God. Why are you so stingy in your text? Why haven't you given us greater uh, amplitude of what in fact took place? Why are you so sparse? Because you've given my Jewish kinsmen great opportunity for rabbinical commentary uh, of every kind. And maybe that was your intention. It was obviously an instance of flagrant filial irreverence. Irreverence is disrespect. It is dishonoring. And I, I have no way to assess to what degree that characterizes the present church of Jesus Christ even at its best. Irreverence. Disrespect. Well, and I've suffered very small measure of it, but sufficient to know that it's there. Hey, I even have received it at Ben Israel from Ben Israel. So evidently, it's deeper than we know. And it needs to be, we need to be made aware of its existence and our disposition for it. What would you say would safeguard us from a disposition toward irreverence and disrespect that would allow a man of God not only to be dishonored, but to enjoy his predicament, to take delight in his being uncovered. How, how can we guard ourselves? How can we move toward a Shem-like reverence and respect for authority? Because the attitude of Shem toward his father is the attitude of Shem toward God. Because our earthly fathers are the statement of the heavenly father. Whether it's a natural father or a spiritual father, how we respond to the fathers that God has given us is the statement of our truest heart to the Father who is in heaven. And that's why God is so jealous of that. And that's why Shem could not wait for a moment to cover his father, because the issue of his father was the issue of the heavenly father. That if his earthly father was dishonored, the heavenly father is dishonored. And a son of Shem cannot tolerate that for a moment. That's reverence. You can almost say that the erring son, Ham Cain, and I put them together as one, had opportunity by observing what Shem and Japheth did in honoring the father to recognize how unbecoming his own attitude was and to repent of it on the spot. And maybe if that repentance had come, it might have saved him the curse that was spoken. But evidently he was so hard in his own heart that even their act could not affect that change. So, how long had he had that heart? And how many days were they in the ark together? And the years that preceded it? How long was this attitude of disrespect being uh, generated and nurtured, waiting its opportunity for expression? So, we have to keep our hearts with all diligence. Now, when the occasion comes, we do not exhibit that. 
And we need to express repentantly our failure to cover Israel for her nakedness in these past millennia and to whatever degree we have gloated over her predicament and rubbed our hands in glee and elevated ourselves at her expense. Or else we cannot become the sons of Shem in truth. So, although precisely this, the offense can scarcely be gathered from the narrative, we may partly guess its motive. It was obviously an instance of flagrant filial irreverence, for not even the last degree of unworthiness in a parent will justify the levity or cruelty of a son. I'll read that again. I love this comment. It's got to be a flagrant filial irreverence, for not even the last degree of unworthiness in a parent will justify the levity, the lightness, or cruelty of a son. Which is to say, no matter what the cause, no matter what the occasion, whether it's drunkenness or anything else, nothing can ever justify the irreverent attitude of the son, uh, Cain and Ham, toward that father's nakedness. That a father has got to be honored, no matter what failing, that there's no failing sufficient to justify our irreverence and our disrespect, because the commandment that that Shem already knew before it was ever pronounced is, Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Mm-hmm. And you know that we say, yes, but look at the father I've had. Or look at my mother that I've had. Now, if they had been different, if they had in any way treated me as I ought to have been, I'm still suffering from their neglect. I'm suffering from their mistreatment. I'm suffering from their abuse. They don't deserve my honor. God says, you're, you're, you're failing to keep the law. You're a lawbreaker. Because there's no condition that will justify the loss of your honoring. I have commanded you to honor, irrespective of what is the condition of your father or your mother. Thou shalt honor. Mm-hmm. Not just the issue of physical death, a termination of your length of days, but a spiritual death commences from the moment that you break that commandment and fail to honor your father. The fear of God is absent from us. We have lost the regard for the Father. And maybe it goes back all to the time that we did not honor our Father, our corporate Father, our the ancestor of us all, which is to say the Jewish nation itself, which is to say Judaism itself, that there's a Father there from which we are derived, that we have not acknowledged nor honored, but have trampled him in the dust in our superior terminology and uh, doctrines of faith, which I'm not saying are in any way wrong, but something of our attitude toward that father has um, still lingers and has removed from us something that ought to be resplendent in our character that would show the evidence of Shem to our Jewish kinsmen. We're not sufficiently persuasive to them, let alone moving them to jealousy. We're just a Gentile culture of a kind that they could easily disdain or ignore or dismiss. And it may go back to the fact that we fail to recognize uh, the, the progenitor of our Christian faith, which is the Judaism, which Jesus honored and walked in in his own earthly lifetime. And in fact said that not so much of one uh, tittle of this law shall fail until all be fulfilled. And that he who uh, is um, the least in the kingdom oh, I, I, I want to get this right. That he who both hears and does all the law is is blessed. So Jesus had an attitude toward the origins of our Christian faith much more honoring and deeply respectful than what we ourselves have known historically as the church. And I think we have lost something. A certain kind of spiritual death has come in from the time that we have not adequately honored our Father. That is to say, the Jewish origins of our own faith. Yes, we we have come to a more glorious dispensation and revelation of the Son, which they yet refrain from acknowledging or being able to see. There's a blindness that is yet upon them, in the complex purposes of God. But that doesn't 
free us from the honoring that is still due them, because as the commentator said, there's no act of the father that justifies the disrespect or irreverence of the son. Thou shalt honor. And by what means shall we honor? Uh, I walked yesterday morning, a spirit of revelation was flowing, and the thought came to me, Thou shalt, I, I wrote it in caps here somewhere, Thou shalt. And that there's an energy in the command. That the ability to obey is already implicit in the command itself. Because to honor is contrary to our nature. Our nature is more disposed to dishonor. Our nature is more to go, is to take advantage of seeing the Father exposed and to exulting in his uh, unhappy condition and exalting ourselves at his expense. That's natural. That's man. But to honor is altogether a godly phenomenon. Honor is God himself. To honor is, is the heart of the divine nature. And God says, I'll, I'll impute that to you. I'll give you the ability to honor when every condition would have encouraged you to exactly the opposite in, the, in your very act of obeying. That there's an energy of force and enablement to enable you to honor a father who's been a drunken bum and a mother who's been a harlot and on drugs and has treated you with uh, unbelievable uh, degradation and you're suffering the scars of it to this very day and you, you cannot even bring yourself to conceive that you can honor such parents. But because you say so, Lord, because you have commanded me, because you say, thou shalt, I will. And in that moment, the power of that thing that has kept you in bondage to the past is broken by the energy to honor given in the commandment. We need to honor the fathers of the past, and we need to honor our present fathers, both the natural and the spiritual, despite their track record, despite their failures, despite their inability to live to our standard. And to what degree is our standard valid? And are we raising standards that invite uh, failing. We, we have an imagined uh, idealism that they somehow are required to fulfill, which is altogether not from God and not in the re realism, the reality of what a father is to be. The father, after all, shows the vulnerability of his humanity and he, all of the foibles that, to which all humanity is heir. He, he, he is of necessity not always going to be the letter perfect epitome of fatherhood and the fact his willingness to be a failure before his sons and to show his humanity and to encourage their own humility is maybe the greatest statement of fatherhood someone has said uh, you're not an elder Art. what? what What have I been then for these past 29-30 years at Ben Israel if I'm not an elder yeah. well you don't have that pastoral ability uh, you're the prophetic man you don't you're, you're not the shepherd Okay, well, I can see that. But I can also see occasions when I know that God has allowed me to be dishonored before the sons of the congregation to give them the same occasion as Noah gave his sons by his dishonoring. And that I realize that that is part of the fatherly designation, part of the fatherly requirement, and that I must not shun it. And not only must I not shun, must not shun it, I must not explain it. I have simply to bear it. And in bearing it, because it serves redemptive purposes, I am acting as father. And how much has God the Father suffered loss in having to be to us what he has in order to bring us into the stature of sons? And how much has he suffered? Reproach and backlash and the condemnation of the, un, uh, the, un, uh, the uh, uninformed because of, what, of what, what being a real father is. So a real father is not to be a squeaky clean epitome of perfection, but somehow to exhibit the kinds of things that are needful in the growing up of sons, in the testing of them, and the bringing them into collision uh, experiences that could not be had except that you're at the expense of your humiliation as father. And if you're unwilling to do that, you're not a shepherd. And you're not a father. 
when I think of the pastoral mystique that has prevailed in churchianity, where the man comes on the platform of faith, of, of, of power and faith and brings his message and, and his voice and his bearing has a certain majesty and then as soon as he's finished he's off the stage. You never see him in his frailty. You never see him in his weakness. And they, they learned that in their seminaries. There is a pastoral mystique that needs to be maintained because we cannot afford to allow the congregation to become disillusioned with its leaders. They have to carry a certain aura of, uh, uh, of something greater than what the congregation could ever hope to obtain and keep that distance or your word will not be credible uh, uh, nor your ministry before them. And we have a real choice here of which way to go. What, what, what is real fatherhood? What is real bringing sons to maturity and to glory? Is it by maintaining a false um, appearance of something that they can never hope to attain? And the idea is you're not supposed to attain it. You're supposed to remain in an inferior congregational condition and look up to the platform that is higher and exalted and be in that kind of dependent relationship that does not encourage growth or maturity. But the father who is at your level and even falls beneath your level probably serves the purposes of God more in encouraging the maturity of sons than the one who hides behind and uh, uh, self-aggrandizes himself at the expense of elevation. Isn't it remarkable that um, these sons can live with this father for how many decades in the building of the ark and evidently there's no inconsistency in the father's character revealed throughout all that time a perfect obedience to God in making something that had never been made before uh, for which he's daily experiencing the reproach and jeers of those who are observing him who are soon to perish in the flood that will come and yet steadfastly honoring the requirement of God and doing it and yet one failure after a lifetime's consistent faithfulness is enough to set in motion the disrespect of the son what do you think of that? a lifetime of credibility is to be brought down by one failure what I'm getting at is our human disposition to clutch that one act uh, even to anticipate it and welcome it when it comes and maybe at the worst of us even to desire it secretly Whew. are we that perverse mm -hmm. that we would secretly desire the fall of a, of a preacher of righteousness and when it comes we, 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 we delight in it and take full benefit of what we have all along been secretly desiring why, why put such a weight on one failure when after all, who, who would have known before the time that wine uh, uh, produces drunkenness? It's not a major sin that a man calculated by foreknowledge. So it deserves the most gracious kind of uh, understanding and dismissal rather than a delight and going outside telling brothers, have you seen what dad did? It? You have to suspect that there's something in the heart of Cain and Ham that desired such a moment, desired such a failing, and it only for them required one. One failing, and they go to town on it. And how many of us have that constituency in our own souls? That we have not the, the uh, grace and um, magnanimity and forgiveness and understanding to cover a fallen brother but uh, rather than to hop upon it. It's, uh, we need, maybe that fall reveals something that we need to see mm -hmm. and that we could not have seen except by it and for it. And unless we see it, and unless we attend to it with the deepest kind of acknowledgement and repentance, how shall we be to Japheth what we ought? <coughs> how shall we be to Israel what we ought? Because Israel does not even know that it has a tent of Shem calling and destiny to the, to the nations unless it is first exhibited to them by the church that uh, uh, is moving in the reality of the character of Shem 
But if we, if we have in our hearts lingering things of the kind that I'm describing, it forbids and nullifies, and it's contrary to the, the, the mentality and spirit of Shem. So we're not dismissing the significance of sin. It's not, not the kind of worldly, sentimental, slobbery thing that passes something over as being light and of no consequence. That would be dishonoring God. Right. Yet at the same time, recognizing the solemnity of sin, we're yet an identification with the sinner in a way that is not condemning but supportive. Yeah. It's interesting that if you read Jimmy Baker's book, as his world became began crashing down upon his ears, and before the whole thing was scandalously exposed, he knew already that he was in a terrible plight. And he describes being in his car and driving around his property and into the local communities and passing by the saloons and the bars tempted to go in because he knew that in those places there was some kind of a, a macho masculine fellowship where men could uh, ex express their hearts and be heard by others that was not available to him in the church why wasn't it avail not available because of the false kind of uh, demeanor that men in ministry are required to project where you cannot acknowledge that I have this problem and therefore must suffer the outworking of it to an uttermost humiliation that might have had another remedy had you been able to communicate to those close to you I need your prayer, I need your counsel, I need your help so he was a victim of a kind of churchianity that kept its skirts clean and didn't want to acknowledge that even a minister can have problems of this kind and can express them in an environment in which he'll not be shot down. He'll neither suffer censure, condemnation, nor will he be, be lightly passed over as, um, uh, what's the word that I used? Condescen condescension. It's an environment of reality that understands and can receive and bear the, these weaknesses and provide the encouragement, prayer, and support until a brother is brought out from it. That's the church. So Jimmy Baker was a victim of the failure of the church to be the church because it has a, adopted a false kind of countenance of a bright white teeth, smiley kind of a thing in which it cannot be conceived that a man would have to struggle and that, uh, and that he would be sharing the kind of things that we face. We're living in the post-Christian era in which iconoclasm, the breaking of idols, the ending of the celebration of heroes, the bringing down is, uh, is characteristic. So um, we have all the more to guard ourselves against the spirit of the age to right. find our way back to the book of Genesis in the place of beginnings and know what it is that God honors and cherishes and to find that reality as Shem had it not by law, not by requirement but by union so that's a, a precious thought in itself and if illusion keeps us from that reality we need to wage war against illusion because illusion is a lie we have an illusion about our, what we ourselves are that needs to be guarded or that we commend to others and we're afraid to speak the truth or acknowledge it even of ourselves, we're living a terrible unreality. And what is the church if it is an unreality? It's the one thing that comes down from heaven as reality. It's the plumb line from heaven to be a, a, a place against which all things can be measured because it's utterly real, because God himself is real. So and let's come back to that thought after break. So Lord, receive our gratitude. This is not a bad beginning. You're okay. <laughs> you, you know how to get us off the ground. You gave us a, an alpha beginning, and we're so grateful. And we know that there's much more, Lord, that you would have us to uh, explore, to probe and bring forth. So may you continue in that wonderful grace. We love the interplay of the saints and the precious comments that have been made and that do not fall on deaf ears. And in fact, we'll have a life beyond this place that this will go forth from here, Lord, and we trust will bring benefit uh, to many, that the church, my God, will 
be brought to the realization of its own need, and there'll be that weeping that precedes its true prophetic call and use. So, bless us, Lord, bring us back, give us more, change us in these days, change us, my God. Show us, Lord, the deep irreverence, show us the the idealism, uh, the vain uh, um, um, views that we hold and by which we measure one another, the expectancy that is unrealistic, that if anyone fails in it, we're quick to jump them because they have failed our expectancy, our definition of what we think they ought to be when we don't even know what a father is. Though you have shown us amply from the very beginning in the conduct of Shem what a father is. He's one who honors and he's one who covers. So we bless you. We give you the praise, Lord. Thank you for a life-changing time. In Jesus' name, amen.